encryption. It's one of those things that almost everyone uses every day. Anytime you browse the internet or make a cell phone call, you're probably using it to watch this video right now. But for most of us, encryption is a bit far off. It's mysterious and complex, in a word, cryptic. And digital devices themselves are fast and complex, a bit mysterious. You can't see what's going on with your data under the hood. So even if you do understand modern encryption algorithms, can you really trust your device or the device of your recipient to keep your information private? If you put sensitive information into an electronic device, it may end up getting transmitted someplace you didn't want or stored longer than you intended. So for some sensitive matters, you may prefer to have a verbal conversation with someone in a private room. But obviously, that's not always practical. But private communication over a distance doesn't have to be dubious. You can do strong encryption with pen and paper. How strong? Well, if done correctly, it's completely unbreakable. Not a question of if or when some technology is gonna come along that's powerful enough to break it. No, it's a mathematical guarantee and will be forever. No need to trust anyone or anything other than yourself and the person you're communicating with who can be on the other side of the world. And you can rest assured that your communication is as private as if you were in the same private room. No leaks, no hacks, no record of what you said. This method is so simple, anyone can do it. If you can read and write, you can do this. It is a bit slow, so you'll want to keep your messages short. A few words. But I think it's interesting and fun, and maybe you'll even find it useful. So the first step is to generate a key. You're going to need paper, pen, and a die. If you don't have a die, later on I'll show you some alternatives. Uh, but for now, let's assume you do. So what you want to do is you want to write on the bottom of your paper, this is going to become one of your keys, to write from and clearly label who it's from. Let's say Joe. And this is very important. We'll talk about why later. And you also want an ID. And this is just going to be four random uh, numbers. So four random throws of the die. So let's see here. Three, one, six, and three. This is your key ID. Next, you wanna draw a line or some kind of marker, it can be a dashed line if you want, about a third of the way up the key. And later on, we're gonna tear this, so that's, that's why we're marking that there. Um, and now, the fun part. You're just gonna take your die or your, or your random number generator um, and generate pairs of numbers, one to six, and write them up here on the top part. So I can roll this a bunch of times. If you're gonna be doing this for real though, I recommend what you do is you get a whole bunch of die and a clear uh, container kind of like this one. And then all you have to do is give it a good shake for a few seconds and then you get a whole bunch of numbers and it's really easy to write them out. So I'm gonna write these out in pairs uh, along the top here of my key. Now when you get to the end and you want to make a second row, uh, you want to leave a space. Okay, and we're going to call that good enough for this key. At this point, this key is done, and the next step is to simply make an exact copy of it. At this point, the next step is to meet up in person securely with your partner and share keys so you each have uh, a copy. Uh, in practice, you probably wanna make several of these. After you meet in person and you and your partner each have a copy of the key, to actually do encryption, you're gonna draw two six by six numbered grids like this. One through six across the top, one through six down the side, And this is gonna be your alphabet table. So now in each of these cells in the grid, you're gonna draw the letters A through Z, 
and the numbers one through nine, and then a dash as follows. So A through Z, one through nine, dash. This is gonna be your alphabet grid. You wanna draw a second grid of one through six across the top, one through six down the sides. And this is going to be your encryption table. Now, what you put in each of these cells is the sum of the two numbers that are on the row and column, but you don't go over six. When you reach six, instead of going to seven, you wrap back around to one, like this. So one plus one is two, two plus one is three, and so on. Now after six, we wrap back around to one. And we can do the same thing down this column. It's basically just counting at this point. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, and then fill out the rows across. And this is your encryption table. You can keep these. You only ever have to make one set of these, but they are easy to generate from memory. We omitted zero here because we don't have room to have zero through nine and, and have a space. It has to be 36 because it's, it's a six by six grid. So we do a dash for space. You can do double dash to separate your sentences if you like, if you have multiple sentences in your message. Um, and then to send numbers, if you wanna send a number that has a zero, uh, you can just use Z for zero uh, or O if you like. Um, if you have a negative number, you can use N to stand for negative, um, P to stand for point. Um, and so it's really not too hard to send uh, numbers this way. Okay, so let's say our message is secret. So we're gonna start with S, that's 41. E is 15. T. We do, uh, we do key message, so row, column, and uh, we simply look it up. So 64 maps to four. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna write those digits down here below the dashed line you made earlier on the key. So four and one is five. And obviously, because these are just uh, addition, this table is just addition, you don't actually need the table. You can do it in your head, um, whatever you find easiest. You just have to be careful not to make a mistake and a table can help you be a little bit more reliable with that. So one and one is two. Two and five is seven, so wrap around, subtract six, you get one, and so on. In real life, you would probably want to consume the entire key, and the reason is that conceals the true length of your message. If you always use the entire key and your keys are always the same length, uh, then, then your encrypted message doesn't reveal anything about its length. So if that's something you care about, uh, go ahead and consume the entire key. Now what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to tear this. Everything up here on this top half that you tore off is secret, private. This, at this time, should be destroyed. Destroy this to the best of your ability. This bottom part here now is your encrypted message. And there's nothing secret on here. So you send the key ID and the digits. If you like, you can just prepend the, the string of digits with the key ID and they'll just know the first four are the ID. Whatever you wanna do there is fine. So the recipient then is going to find their key with the matching ID and they are simply going to copy down the encrypted digits beneath their key digits. So we're gonna just simply do the same thing we did before, just using the table in reverse. So we're gonna look up six, four, and write the, the result down here at the bottom. So six, four, again going in reverse, maps to four. Four, five, four, and we find five right here in the row, that maps up to one. And we do that going across. This is essentially just subtraction. So again, you don't need to use the table. The, the cipher digit minus the key digit is gonna give you your message digit. Um, so four minus six, well, we have to add six first. So four plus six is 10, minus six is four. Five minus four is one, two minus one is one. Um, one 
minus two is not gonna work, we have to add six, so seven minus two is five, and so on. Once you have all the digits decrypted, you simply take your alphabet table and decode each pair. And this is the fun part. This is where you get to see what the message actually says. So four, one is S, one, five is E, and six, six is dash. And had I continued the numbers here, these would all be six, 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 and you just get dash, 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 um, and uh, consume the rest of the key. But you can see here, we have our original message, decrypted, secret. It is still important to destroy the top half because that ensures that it will not be reused. Um, and if it's ever discovered, the, the cipher digits, which were transmitted digitally with a device, uh, can't be decoded. Quick notes on this. The absolutely critical requirements for security is that we have quality randomness for the key, number one, uh, and we'll talk more about that later. Number two, the keys must be kept secret. They must be handled with care. That's why you have to meet in person uh, or via a trusted courier um, to exchange them. And number three, this is very important, keys must only be used once. That's why it's important to label each key with the sender so you don't have both parties accidentally overstepping each other and sending messages on the same key. If a key is used twice, it actually becomes, it, this whole cipher goes from unbreakable to actually pretty easy to break. So it's very important that the keys are only used once. And that's it. This encryption method is an implementation of the one-time pad cipher, which is known to be unbreakable when done correctly. So what makes this so secure? The core of the encryption here deals with the digits one to six. The alphabet table is merely a way of representing pairs of these digits. Each digit of the message is shifted by a random amount and can become any other digit with equal probability, so the cipher digit is as random as the key. Or another way of looking at it is, each digit of the random key is shifted by the message digit. Since it starts out at a random position, it's impossible to predict how each message digit will transform into the cipher digit. The only way to recover the message digit from the cipher digit is by knowing the key. This property of the cipher is called perfect secrecy. For an analogy, suppose you know that in the future you want to send a secret number to someone. So you randomly shuffle a deck of cards and duplicate it, giving them a copy. You later communicate the secret number by counting that number of cards from the top and noting what card you stopped on. You then transmit to your partner what card you found, and they count from the top in their deck until they find that card. For someone intercepting the communication, given only the value of the card and not knowing how the deck was shuffled, it's completely impossible to know how many cards were counted. This is perfect secrecy. Now, that same logic applies if instead of shuffling the deck, it's simply cut to offset the starting card by a random amount. Without the deck, you can't know just from the card value how many cards from the top it is. Do this with a deck of six cards instead of 52, and this is now exactly what our cipher does. Each row in our encryption table essentially cuts the deck, so to speak, offsetting the starting position by the amount corresponding to the key. What are the implications of this perfect secrecy? Most ciphers are like a box locked with a combination lock. With enough time and energy, you can try every possible key, and eventually you'll find the one that unlocks it and lets you see what's inside the box. Modern digital ciphers are secure because the keys are long enough that it would take thousands of years to try every key, even with fast computers. That's a bit of a simplification, but the point is that there's usually a measure of success. Either the key works or it doesn't. But this pen and paper encryption, the one-time pad, is an entirely different game. With the key as long as the message itself, there is no measure of success. Every single key you could try will unlock the box, but changes what's inside. Any ciphertext can be decrypted to any message of the same length by applying the appropriate key. Trying every possible key will simply yield every possible message with no hint at all of which is correct. All possible messages are equally likely. What's the bottom line here? Given only the ciphertext, the message is unpredictable and unknowable to the exact extent that the key is unpredictable and unknowable. And the key is unpredictable and unknowable to the exact extent that the mechanism used to generate the key is unpredictable. In other words, how truly random it is. This brings us to the importance of quality randomness in generation methods. What is randomness? Without getting too philosophical, for our usage, we can define it as the degree to which a potential eavesdropper to our communication cannot predict or discover patterns within the random key. The enemies of perfect randomness here are correlation and bias. 
Correlation is when one digit has some influence over subsequent digits. Bias is when some digits are more likely to occur than others. Correlation can't be measured just from the samples. You can try to find patterns, but you'll be limited by the intelligence of your analyzing methods, which aren't infinite, and you can never prove that correlation isn't there. Instead, the best you can do is to inspect and reason about the generation mechanism itself. For example, throwing a die and letting it bounce and roll, although governed neatly by the laws of physics, is chaotic enough that most of us intuitively know there won't be any successful influence from one number to the next, so long as it tumbles sufficiently before stopping. Bias, on the other hand, can be measured from just the numbers. Just generate enough samples and do statistics. But generating samples takes a lot of time and effort, and statistics isn't for everyone. So it's useful to use intuitive reasoning here as well. How much impact do bias and correlation have on the security of the cipher? The answer is, it depends. It depends on the length, structure, and content of your messages, any context about your messages that potential third parties might know, and what you consider to be a break of the cipher. Unlike most ciphers where breaking is largely all or nothing, like unlocking a locked box, breakage of this cipher due to poor quality keys is more probabilistic. Unless your source of randomness is of laughably poor quality, it's unlikely that your exact message will be recoverable in full detail. Instead, some vague insights about the message might be recoverable if the key is of poor quality. This is hard to visualize with letters and numbers, so let's look at a more tangible example. Pictures. If we treat pixels as numbers, with a number corresponding to the brightness of the pixel, we can encrypt an image in a similar way. Encrypting with high-quality randomness, you can see that all detail is completely obliterated. But as the bias in key generation increases, some larger features in the image are detectable. There may not be much detail here, but there is clearly some round shape there. If you happen to know that the image taken is either a flower or a box truck, you can make a good guess that it's a flower. That context you had about the image makes even slight detail more useful. As bias increases further, so does the level of detectable detail. This image doesn't contain very many pixels, a mere 30,000. But what happens if we take the same biased randomness and use it to encrypt a higher resolution version of the photo containing 12 million pixels? This time, there is a lot more information leaking through. The biased encryption still hides smaller features and details, but since the overall image has so many more pixels, we can detect the larger trends and infer quite a lot of useful information from the image as a whole. Now, the numbers on display here obviously don't translate to encrypting characters and words, but the principles of key quality do. The takeaway points are, large trends are detectable if the key is of poor quality. The poorer the randomness, the more detail is detectable. Knowledge of message context makes fuzzy broad insights more strategically useful to third parties. The importance of quality randomness scales with message size and quantity. So with all that in mind, I present to you some practical alternatives to DICE for key generation. But your mileage may vary. I make no guarantees about the quality of the results, so please use your good judgment and reasoning. Number one, mental generation. This is where you just make up the numbers out of your head and try to be random. So numbers from one to six, let's say one, three, two, and so on. You just make them up out of your head. This is not recommended. Human minds are known to be terrible sources of randomness. Our brains love patterns, and any numbers you pull out of your brain will be both biased and correlated. So don't fool yourself into thinking you're smart enough to generate randomness. You can't. Still, it's a quick and easy way to produce keys and might serve you in a pinch. Number two, drawing numbered objects from a container. So you take some identical objects, like these little pieces of paper here, and draw numbers on them. Put them in a container and shake the container up and draw numbers at random. The quality of this method is really hard to evaluate because it all depends on how you implement it. If the objects are soft, like this paper, um, I expect this could become biased or correlated as the paper pieces bend and crease uh, and become harder or easier to grab or tumble inside, maybe stick to each other. Uh, so I personally, I don't trust this method, at least not with paper objects. Number three, coin flip. This is where you just simply flip a coin, get heads or tails, uh, and use binary numbers. So tails zero, heads one, and your binary numbers as follows. You have to throw out zero and throw out seven because those are invalid, and you're just left with one through six like this. 
The quality is solid in this method as coin flips are largely fair. Uh, there is one study that showed there can be some bias, but it's like less than 1%. Not worth worrying about for this in my opinion. So it's good quality, but almost prohibitively tedious. Since you need to throw out zero and seven, you average four flips per digit or eight flips per message character. But if you need really solid randomness on short notice and don't have anything else, simply flipping a coin will work. Four, coin spin. This is my favorite method for short notice improvisation. What you do is you take a coin and note the top of the engraving on the coin. Doesn't matter, heads or tails. You can put a, a little mark here like I did if you want. But you simply spin the coin on a flat surface and then press it down gently with something flat like this piece of paper. And note where it ends up. Imagine a sliced hexagon with the pieces of the pie, numbers one through six, and see which segment the top of the engraving lands in. In this case, I'm gonna call that a one. And you just keep going like that. Spin the coin, press it down. In this case, I'll call that a six. Obviously, there's some subjectivity here since you're just imagining the hexagon and hence there's gonna be some bias, but the bias will hopefully be reasonably small and the spinning coin obliterates any correlation. I like this method because you can crank out digits quickly without any prep work using just a coin but it's not perfect. Method five, this is where you use dice or even better, a box of dice. Now, ordinary dice like this can have some measurable bias, uh, but it tends to be pretty small. And again, in my opinion, not worth worrying about for the short messages used in this pen and paper encryption method. If you're really paranoid, you can use real casino dice, which are machined with precision and have almost no bias at all. But unless you're encrypting hundreds of thousands of characters, the bias in regular game dice like this is too small to worry about, in my opinion. So final thoughts on these generation methods. The cipher is only provably unbreakable with perfect randomness, but imperfect randomness doesn't necessarily mean that someone will actually be able to break it or get any inf meaningful information from it. If you're only going to be sending a small handful of short messages, mentally generated keys might be good enough. If you start sending more messages or longer messages, you'll want to use a better source of randomness like dice. Some additional features and thoughts about this encryption method as a whole. It doesn't have to be just two people. You can communicate within a small group of people by duplicating the keys to more than two copies. Just make sure you clearly label a sender associated with each key to ensure two people don't accidentally use the same key to send a message. Although it guarantees perfect secrecy of the message content, it does not guarantee authenticity. There is no proof that the communication wasn't tampered with during transmission. Furthermore, if an interceptor knows something about the structure of the message, they can alter pieces of the ciphertext to mess up the message in subtle and undetectable ways. And if they know a portion of the message, they can work out the key for that portion and change those characters to anything they want of the same length. But for unstructured freeform messages in plain language, where third parties don't know the structure, the recipient has practical assurance for themselves that their key partner sent the message and it wasn't significantly altered, as only someone with the key could create ciphertext that decrypts to non-gibberish. This lack of provable authenticity may sound like a disadvantage, but it's also an advantage. The recipient cannot prove to anyone else what the message is unless they shared the key without the sender's knowledge ahead of time. After the ciphertext exists, Anyone with the ciphertext, even without the key, can easily fabricate a fake key to decrypt the ciphertext to any message of the same length. Since the sender destroyed their key, the only people in the world who can ever know with certainty what was communicated are those who possessed the key prior to the sender transmitting the ciphertext. So effectively, you can communicate in secret over a distance with no written record, so long as your partner guards the key at least up until the point where a message is transmitted. After a message is encrypted and sent and the source key destroyed, no condemning betrayal of privacy can occur. It's exactly like having a verbal conversation in a private room. So long as the person you're speaking to hasn't secretly invited a third party to hide behind the curtain and listen, then what you say forever remains private. Even if they later decide to betray your trust, the only evidence they have is their word. There could, of course, be outside evidence such as fingerprints on the key paper, but there is no evidence within the encryption itself. Another useful feature of this scheme is that you can use multiple keys to encrypt and consequently require multiple keys to decrypt. Since it's just addition and subtraction, the order in which keys are applied doesn't matter, and you can even make a master key on one end by adding the keys together. This has some cool applications. Number one, 
If meeting in person to exchange keys isn't feasible, you can send two keys to your partner via two couriers. Both couriers must be compromised in order to compromise the secrecy of the final encryption. Number two, suppose you're on your deathbed and your children don't get along with each other. You can use multiple keys to encrypt information about how to access your fortune and give a key to each child. They will need to work together in order to decrypt your instructions. That's it for the encryption technique, but there's one more application for it that I want to show you. If you encrypt messages and transmit long sequences of numeric digits to someone, it looks a little bit weird. It's pretty clear to any observer that you're exchanging some type of code. But what if you could hide the very existence of your encryption and even hide the fact that you and your partner are communicating at all? Once you master the basic encryption technique, taking it to the next level is actually very simple. Here's the process. Prepend the encrypted digits with the key ID to get a stream of cipher digits. Write a large chunk of innocuous text about any topic. This will be the carrier text. Each sentence in the carrier text will correspond to one encrypted digit in the cipher. Tweak the carrier sentence so that the number of words matches the cipher digit when circularly counted. The first sentence already matches, so no adjustment is needed here. For the next sentence, we'll add two words to go from 5 to 6 and then circularly back to 1 for a match. Continue on tweaking the text to encode the cipher digits. To determine what counts as one word, follow these guidelines. Generally count words as they would be spoken. Ignore punctuation other than sentence ending punctuation. Contractions count as a single word. Expanding or forming contractions are a useful tool for tweaking word count. If how to count a piece of text isn't clear, simply rephrase it to remove ambiguity. To the degree that your sentence editing looks natural and not detectably altered, and to the degree that your encryption keys used quality randomness, the existence of a hidden cipher and message is impossible to detect in the carrier text. Any text can be equally decoded and deciphered into any message of the correct length by applying the corresponding key. And you don't even need to send the carrier text directly to your recipient. Since the very existence of the message is hidden and perfectly encrypted, you can post the carrier text somewhere public like a blog, article, or newspaper and hide any trace that you're communicating with your partner. Both your message and your communication are perfectly secret. We've covered a lot of ground discussing this cipher in depth, so let's recap the core process in its most simple form. Step 1. Use dice to generate random digits and create a key, labeling who it's from and a random ID. Give a copy of this key to your partner. Step two. Later, when you're ready to encrypt a message, draw a six by six grid and fill in with letters A to Z, numbers one to nine, and something for a space, a dash. Step three. Use the grid to convert your message into digits and circularly add up each digit with the digit from the key to obtain the cipher digit. Send the cipher digits to your partner who will then do circular subtraction to recover the message. That's it. Not much to remember if you ever find yourself needing this technique. And so we have this system with easy to improvise objects, no technology. You can communicate and encrypt your communication, even hide your communication with someone with no trace. And I think that's really cool. It's like a virtual private room that'll always be there for you. I think that's cool. Thanks for watching.